Hello everyone, welcome to this fourth lecture of the course uh, Cyber Physical System Fundamentals. In this fourth lecture I'm going to teach again some of the embedded system foundations of uh, cyber physical system design. Today we are going to continue the discussion of specification and modeling techniques. In general, uh, the structure of uh, this uh, second chapter that I'm presenting right now is shown on this slide. You should remember this uh, table. In this table, just to remind you, uh, we are including the different uh, modeling techniques, the different models of computation, as well as some samples of uh, languages corresponding to such models of computation are included. In one dimension, in the horizontal dimension, we have uh, the um, models that we're using for uh, communication. And in the or vertical dimension, we have the models that we're using for the computations within the components. And you should also remember that uh, during the last lecture, I looked at the very first row. The very first row uh, deals with uh, techniques that we're using for the early specification phases uh, where we don't want to care about the details of uh, the model of computation within the components. And we looked at plain text use cases and uh, sequence charts. Also towards the end of the last lecture, uh, we looked at the second row where uh, we are dealing with models of computation that are based on finite uh, state machines. There I introduced the notion of timed automata. A timed automata overcome one of the limitations of uh, classical automata, uh, namely the lack of uh, the model of uh, time. In timed automata we can indeed model time. However, timed automata, as they were introduced uh, during the last lecture, still have certain deficiencies. For example, it's very difficult to describe rather complex computations, and also the models that I presented there uh, don't uh, include uh, any um, technique for modeling hierarchy. So therefore, during today's lecture, I will look at some other entries in this row. In particular, we will be looking at uh, state charts as uh, a language which is based on a model of computation which combines shared memory communication with uh, finite state machines as a model for the uh, components. And uh, later this week we will look at SDL as one particular language which is based on a model combining message passing with finite state machines. So let's look at uh, state charts. Uh, state charts is a modeling language which uh, tries uh, uh, to overcome one of the limitations of classical automata. It tries to overcome the problem that classical automata don't allow us to use uh, hierarchy. And therefore we have this problem that as humans we can hardly understand very complex classical automata if they are described. in 1987 and uh, David Harrell called the resulting language uh, state chart and the models we are calling state charts. Uh, David explained his choice of uh, the name uh, as follows. He said the uh, state chart was the only unused combination of uh, flow or state with diagram or chart. So at the time state charts were introduced, uh, flow diagram, flow chart, uh, state diagram, they were all already used. So therefore state chart, uh, ch state chart was uh, chosen as a name. We are using state chart here as a very prominent example of a model of uh, computation which is based on shared memory communication. So from the general discussion of uh, using shared memory communication as a technique for communication, we do already know that there is a very uh, inherent uh, limitation there. We know that shared memory-based communication works reasonably only for local systems, so we can hardly use that language for distributed systems. 
Now, in order to overcome this essential limitation of uh, classical automata, uh, namely the lack of uh, the capabilities for modeling hierarchy, I'd like uh, to demonstrate uh, this introduction using this particular slide over here. Uh, at the top of the slide, you see a classical uh, flat uh, state diagram. And I did already mention earlier that for this uh, flat state diagram, we have the problem uh, that for exceptions, we need quite a number of explicit transitions. And that uh, due to the need to describe uh, exceptions, we will frequently end up uh, with uh, rather complex state diagrams. Now, this can be avoided if indeed uh, we introduce hierarchy. And in the lower half of the diagram of the slide, we see uh, that uh, there this uh, so called superstate is uh, introduced. S denotes a superstate. And the superstate S comprises uh, states uh, A to E. And now we can use a single transition, a single arrow over here, uh, to denote uh, all these uh, uh, transitions that uh, were explicit up there. Uh, the meaning is exactly the same down here, and you see that now it's much easier to denote uh, uh, that uh, uh, transition that should be taken in the case of an exception, say K. Now the superstate uh, S includes all these uh, substates A to E. And uh, uh, we already noticed from the introduction that uh, for this kind of superstate, obviously we will be in uh, one of the states of the superstate. So we will be in A, B, C, D, or E. Now, if uh, uh, initially we were in this uh, state Z, and if uh, there would be an input of M, then we would have a transition into this uh, state A. And if next there would be an input of G, we would have a transition into B. And if next there would be an input of uh, H, we would have a transition to state uh, C. And if the next input would be an input of k, we would have a transition back uh, to this uh, state uh, z. So this is uh, our informal introduction of uh, hierarchy uh, as it is available in uh, state charts. Now looking uh, at a somewhat more uh, precisely defined set of definitions, uh, we see the following terms that uh, are needed when we discuss uh, state charts as a modeling uh, language. First of all, we have already seen, and this is also again visible down here, that for state charts, we are in several of the states, so to say, at the same time. We are at the same time in the superstate S and in the substate A. Uh, all the states in which we are in at a particular point in time are called uh, the set of active states. Now also we see that uh, some of the states don't have any substates. So states uh, A to E and uh, C, they are states not comprising any substates. Such states are called the basic states. And also we see uh, that there are states that do include substates. And in particular in this example, we have S uh, as a state uh, that uh, does have uh, substates and such a state is called a superstate. If a superstate is a superstate uh, for which we are in only for one of the substates, then such a superstate is called a or superstate, and obviously S is an or superstate over here. Now, for the hierarchy as it has been introduced so far, uh, we have one problem. And the one problem is the fact that in this case we have an explicit edge leading towards one of the substates. This means that when we use uh, S, the superstate, uh, as the entity for modeling, we would nevertheless need to know something about the internals of that superstate. We need to know that there is such a, a substate A. Now, this is uh, not very clean because when we do the modeling at the level of the superstates, we would like to avoid any knowledge about the details of uh, the uh, superstates, and we would like to avoid having to look into these uh, superstates. Now, in order 
uh, to um, hide the internals of the superstate, we can take advantage of the so-called default state mechanism. With the default state mechanism, we are identifying one of the uh, substates of S as the default state. And uh, the meaning of this is the following. Whenever we branch into that superstate, uh, then we would effectively be branching into that uh, uh, default state. And graphically, the default state is identified by this little, little circle. And I have to make sure that uh, you uh, understand that this little circle is not a state by itself. It's just used to identify that initial state. It's just used to identify the default state. So in this way, we can hide the internal structure of the superstate S. And we don't need to know the details of the implementation of uh, S when we use S in a larger system. Now there is another mechanism that can be used in order to hide the internal structure and that is the so-called history mechanism. Uh, the history mechanism is very useful if we have a situation where from a certain a super state we would like to call another state like uh, we call a subroutine. For example, we can think of being in the state B, and while we are in the state B, we would possibly like to uh, go to state Z, like we go to a subroutine. So if there were, for example, some exception, then we would possibly like uh, to go that uh, to that state Z, where we possibly would handle that exception. And then if we had uh, an input of M, then in this case, we would be going back to the state where we came from. So this is exactly what the history state mechanism is doing. If we use the history state mechanism, then whenever we re-enter some super state, uh, we go into that substate that we were in when the last time we were in that particular super state. Obviously, uh, this uh, leaves a question, where do we go to if we enter the super state for the very first time? Now, uh, in order to make sense, we would need to combine the history mechanism with, the, uh, with some other mechanism like the default mechanism. So uh, in this notation, in this example, we are combining uh, the default mechanism with the history mechanism. If we enter S for the very first time, uh, we will be going into that state A and otherwise we go into the last state that we have been in. Now there is one possible source of uh, confusions and it's the fact that normally uh, we are using a circle also to denote the history mechanism. Now the circle may be a little smaller than the other circles, than the circles used to denote uh, the basic states, but nevertheless this is a possible source of confusions. In order to help you to uh, avoid this confusion, I'm using a different font. Uh, for the history mechanism and also I'm trying to make that circle much uh, smaller. Since we are typically combining the history mechanism with the default state mechanism, there's also a way to indicate uh, that explicitly. Uh, if you look at this uh, uh, graphical notation, uh, you will see this uh, graphical notation that's exactly equivalent to the notation that we have here in the lower half of that slide. You see that in this case we are making it more explicit that we are combining the default state mechanism with the history mechanism. So in this way uh, uh, it's a little easier to avoid confusion. History and uh, default mechanisms can be used hierarchically. That means uh, we could well have hierarchical states uh, as substates of S, and these in turn could be using the history and default uh, state mechanisms. Now with the introduction of uh, hierarchy, we have already uh, solved one of the problems that we have for uh, cl classical uh, uh, finite state machines. But one problem that's very uh, uh, important that still uh, needs to be handled is the problem of a lack of concurrency in standard uh, finite state machines. Now, uh, in order to, to introduce hierarchy, uh, we are extending the set of superstates that are available in state charts, and we are calling these the and superstates. 
For n superstates, we will be in all of the immediate substates of a superstate at the same time. And I'd like to demonstrate this by looking at an answering machine. The entire system in this case is called an answering machine. And the answering machine can be in uh, the on superstate, which in this case is an and superstate. And it can also be in this uh, off state. If it's in the on state, then it will always be in all of its substates at the same time. And since this is an AND superstate, we are indicating this fact by using a dashed line over here. And whenever we are in this ON state, we will be in both of the substates. We will be both in the line monitoring state and in the key monitor monitoring state. Now these states may again uh, contain uh, certain substates, like in this case where we see there is one default state, that's a state in which we are waiting for an incoming call, so we are waiting until a certain call is received through the incoming line. And uh, concurrently we are also waiting for the user to push to some key. Now suppose that there is an incoming call, uh, then uh, we would be going into uh, this particular state and also we just heard the click more or less concurrently the user also pressed the key uh, which resulted in this transition to uh, this uh, uh, hierarchical state where we are handling uh, the, uh, the user's wishes with respect to this answering machine. Now after some time uh, we might have a transition back into uh, that waiting state. That means this answering machine has uh, worked on the user's requirement, has handled uh, the key presses by the user, and if the calling person is also hanging up the phone, then we will have the transition back uh, to this waiting state. So I think this is a good example to demonstrate how we can model concurrency with and superstates. These two states uh, are the states that we will be in concurrently whenever we are in this on state. Now, uh, there is again a possible source for confusion. There is a possible source for confusion because users could use these errors uh, in a somewhat strange way. Uh, you could use the errors in such a way that it looks as if a transition resulting from pressing the on key will just go into that uh, right substate. However, there is a rule that we will always be in all of the substates of an AND superstate. So therefore, even though the graphical representation might indicate something different, if we push the on key, then we will be going to both of the substates there. So always remember, whenever you have an AND superstate, you will always be in all of the substates. And whenever you leave an AND superstate, you will always leave all the substates, even though the graphical representation may be a little misleading there.